Emotions Matter, brought to you by emaw.com. That's E-M-A-W-W dot com, your solution for emotional intelligence. Today I am talking to Christoph Trapp. He's a global keynote speaker, a blogger, an author, a content marketing expert, and he puts a focus on authentic authentic storytelling with everything that he does. Christoph, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. No problem at all. So I've been really curious to ask you this. Um, how did you first get exposed to the idea of authentic storytelling? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for asking that. So I, my background is actually, I grew up as a journalist. And as you, you know, you probably know, journalists actually have the capacity and, and um, you know, opportunity to tell a lot of stories, right? They, they report back on the community that they're part of and uh, add context and those kind of things. So that was my first um, journey into storytelling. Of course, we didn't call it storytelling back then. Um, but that's really, really what it was. And then I really just moved the journalistic um, kind of storytelling to other industries. So I've done that and uh, with banks and credit unions in the nonprofit um, area, and then also now with uh, healthcare organizations and, and really anybody else who who is interested in, in, first of all, living their authentic story and then sharing it. So it's kind of a, it was really a concept that came out of that combined experience of journalism and then, of course, brands moving into uh, publishing more and more of their own content. And, you know, even there's some brands that have like brand newsrooms um, that share stories constantly. But the key is um, to actually share stories that happen. So sometimes we have people, they come up with these elaborate editorial calendars, and I'm a big fan of planning but, you know, then they say, we're going to publish this story down the road and then this story then. And authentic storytelling, something happens that has something to do with what your business actually does. And you share those stories and then you share them on whatever channel, whatever channels are relevant. Right. Sometimes that's Facebook, sometimes Twitter. I would always recommend somewhere on on your website, of course. Uh, but you do share them in um, an almost live kind of um, cadence. So it happens, you share it. Very nice. I like that concept. So what's an example of, um, like for a bank, uh, what, how would a bank use authentic storytelling to kind of help their their brand and their business as an example? Yeah, so banks is always interesting because a lot of people don't want to talk about their financial situations, <laughs> for examples. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you want to think about what kind of difference did you make in the community? What's something that happened or what's something that, um, you know, that had an impact on somebody? And then you just figure out, are people okay sharing that story? So, for example, if uh, if I'm working with a bank and they, they help me, um, buy my first house, right? I mean, there is a good story there or or to move into a new home or, or, or whatever the story might be. Um, there's always stories that we can share, but it always comes back to what's the point of that business, right? So it needs to be related. Sometimes we see um, uh, human interest stories that are out of context. So basically what I mean by that, like if you take like a swimming pool as an example. So swimming pools have... Um, stories too, right? Sometimes they're good stories, sometimes not so good. But then what I see is um, some of those pools, they're sharing um, stories of the lifeguards, right? They say, here's here are all these lifeguards, here's this person and that person. But end of the day, it's like you could care less if lifeguard A likes to eat ice cream when their shift is done and lifeguard B likes to go play pool or whatever it might be, right? So it needs to be within context, Mm -hmm. So, like, the story could be this lifeguard, you know, uh, because of this new thing, uh, his, his or her response to an emergency is now 
10 seconds quicker, which is here's what the difference can make. Um, so it needs to be within context, needs to have something to do with what the business does. And the other thing, you know, when I do this exercise, when I speak and I say, tell me a story that happened um, last week or so. And a lot of people share personal stories. And the reason we share personal stories is because they happen to us, right? So the, the key is how do we tie our personal stories to the organizations that we're actually part of or, or that has something to do with, uh, with our business? Mm -hmm. It makes sense. And I think from the listener standpoint or from the audience's standpoint, the authenticity piece is so important because it's it's very real and very relatable. And I think it probably builds trust pretty quickly. Do you find that too? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, authenticity is kind of a uh, – it, sometimes it's a little bit perception, right? Even if you think about – I mean, there's – or, or sometimes we don't agree with it necessarily, right? Somebody else – might be authentic, but if they're a jerk, doesn't we don't we might not like that um, either. But 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 it helps no matter um, no matter if everybody likes it or not. But it does help with the overarching community that that person is part of, right? You can't please everybody, um, but and, and we don't want to be jerks and we don't want to do things that necessarily um, negatively affect other people. Uh, but we can't also be loved by everybody, right? So we do have to sometimes stand for something or or have a different opinion or whatever it might be. Uh, and that's all part of being authentic and um, actually living your story. Absolutely. Well, tell us a bit about your book. You wrote a book called Get Real. Tell us a bit about that and, and kind of your purpose behind writing that and, and what you were trying to do with that. Yeah, of course. So I, you know, I was kind of fighting the whole writing a book thing for a few years. And people kept saying, you should really write a book. Why don't you write a book? And I'm like, I don't know, people can just read my blog, right? It's all <laughs> on there. And turns out, you know, people can indeed read the blog, but people still read books, believe it or not. So this is from a digital guy here. You know, print is not dead at all. People still buy books, people still read them. Um, and so I, I decided that I would actually write that. It was my first book. My second book uh, actually came out in 2017 here, um, you know, how to be more customer focused. Um, and that was co-written. Co uh, we talk about technology side of things and also like the storytelling side of things. But basically both books were written well, in the, with a the block to book strategy. So what that means is, you know, you make you make an outline in the in perfect scenario. Here's what the book will entail, and then you write blog posts that actually can be fairly easily or fairly writing quotation marks turned into um, chapters in the book. So you write these blog posts every week, you know, 500 to a thousand words, whatever it might be, and then they just become the chapters. Now that sounds really easy in theory, but nothing is ever as easy as it sounds. So um, there's still quite a bit of work involved, you know, after you write them because, like, the, it doesn't flow. You need transitions. You need to move chapters around. When you get like 180 pages, right, moving chapters around is actually more work than it than it should be, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so then I published it, and you know, publishing today, it's like, it the publishing part is so easy anymore i mean you really just go on amazon create space.com which is owned by amazon and you literally just upload your book you know and make sure you have the right um, margins and you have the, the right font and size and all those things and you can even like i wouldn't recommend this but you could even just use one of the templates for your cover like i had somebody design my covers but you could just do that i mean they're not um that great, but if you don't have, you know, whatever it might be, a couple hundred bucks to, to, to get a design done, you could even do that and just just go with that. And then and then you just print them. Uh, they print them on demand. And sometimes people say to me, so do you have like 4,000 books at home in the garage? I'm like, no, I have my car in my garage. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so but I, I don't. And, and I order like maybe 20, 30 at a time just so I have some at hand, right, when people ask mm -hmm. if they want to buy one or or whatever, but but yeah, you can order them on Amazon and um, and it, it you can do Prime, uh, Amazon Prime, so it gets to you in two days. I think they print them on demand. I really I couldn't tell you quite honestly, but you can get them on demand um, or Amazon Prime. I mean, 
And then the Kindle version, of course, is is available too. But that whole process, I mean, there's things you can learn and always do better, but it's it's fascinating how much easier some of those things have become, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it used to be if you didn't have a publisher, good luck, right? And now you can you can just kind of do that, and, and, and I did. So um, I'll probably do another one at some point here, um, but yeah. Have you found the book to be a good marketing piece for you to kind of uh, segue into your speaking and the other things that you do? Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is too, you can you can sell them, obviously, right? So yep. if like if you speak somewhere, you can tie in books and offer them for sale. Or you can ship them there. I mean, I was in Europe uh, late 2016 here, and uh, two conferences, and both conferences, one was in Dusseldorf, Germany, one was in Barcelona, Spain, and and both got books. So I actually. I just ordered them behind the scenes and directly shipped them over there. And then they had a big box of books and I could sign them for people. Um, so it is like, it, it is a nice thing that, that, that you can add on to your other things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when we think about um, everything that we've talked about to this point, why do you think it is people are so fascinated with storytelling? I mean, you look at, you know, children in a classroom, and I can remember doing this, and you probably do too, but, you know, sitting in Indian style on the ground and listening to the teacher tell a story, and even today as adults, you know, we watch the news, we use social media, and we even speak face-to-face. Why do you think people from all ages and all places are fascinated with storytelling? Yeah, uh, so you probably won't catch me sitting Indian style or whatever. And... <laughs> Sounds painful at this age for me. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it does, so you won't catch me doing that, but... but... You know, people are fast. People, it's they. Uh, stories are relatable, and as much as everybody claims that they make decisions logically, most people don't actually make decisions logically. They make make them on emotions, and stories actually help us um, steer our emotions right, and and we relate to them. So, for example, if I tell a story, you know, like I'll give you this example. When I was a news reporter a few years ago, I did an investigation into if you, uh, you know, if you fought your traffic tickets, what was the chance that they would be dismissed? And in the six-county area, I found at that time, I have no idea if it's still the same, obviously, but at that time, if you fought your ticket, your chances were about 50-50 to either get it dismissed or get a lower penalty, right? So pretty good, mm-hmm. I mean, if you really if you think about it. And this one woman, um, probably the best ticket I found, so she went in front of the judge and said, she was like 10, 10 15 miles over. I don't, I don't remember exactly, maybe 18 or something. And she said, Your Honor, there's no way I would have been, I could have been speeding because I was driving by this little church and I say a little prayer. And had I been speeding, I would have not had, had time to finish my prayer. And I did finish it. I'm confident. So, um, what well, can you tell me? What did the church look like? <laughs> so what kind of what kind of car was she driving? Can you tell? You know? Uh oh. Uh, but you had a picture in your head, right? What it yeah. looked like. I mean, you could, you know. And when I tell that story, where locally where it happened, and I actually say the town, which wouldn't be relevant to you or your your listeners. Like, people actually claim they know what street it's on. And it's not the street people think. Interesting. It's not. But but people picture it, right? So, like, they have – so, like, you could go home and you could tell that story tonight, right? Or you, yep. could, um, you could repeat that story because it's very visual. It's very – it's interesting. It's new. Um, sometimes it's interesting to see – so, if I'm talking to, like, a room full of nonprofit people – Usually, it's not always the case, but when, let's say it's a room of nonprofit people. I share the story. I say, "What do you think? Is that true?" And they go, it "Could be." Usually, that's nonprofit people. Usually, not yeah. always, but a lot of times. <laughs> and if I say it, and it's a room full of like current or former journalists, I said, "What do you think? Could that be true?" It was like, "No way! Never!" Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it dep- it also depends on like who the audience is and on what their perception is. So, but the bottom line is storytelling works because we connect over stories we don't connect over um boring facts right we and that's why you hear people um like when people give powerpoint presentations unless they have a good story like nobody remembers anything in those powerpoints 
you know you're right and and so it needs to be uh it needs to be interesting and it needs to be told in a way that that is actually memorable right that we Mm -hmm. can remember and um and unfortunately you know, I would love to agree that people are fascinated by it because that means people do it constantly. But unfortunately, a lot of people um, forget how to do it because there's a little bit of risk, um, you know, because you might share a story somebody else doesn't like or they want to argue with you about it or, or something like that. I think um, like even on my blog now, you know, I have enough readers now that I get sometimes get negative comments. And, and uh, in fact, it went so far at one point that, or not at one point, but like every once in a while, that, you know, the, the mean tweets they do on Jimmy Kimmel where the athletes read um, the mean tweets people have sent at them. Yeah. So I actually, like, I got my own version of that, my own video on saying, here's what people said about me sharing a story. So people, it's like the digital lynch mob sometimes, you know, people, they don't do it themselves, but then they, then they judge everybody else. And, um, so I, I hope more people do it and more people um, live their story and, and share their experiences. And I wanted to answer your question you asked me earlier. So when you were talking about the lady driving by the church, for whatever reason, I saw a white car. I don't know what kind of car, maybe a Buick or an American car of some kind. And then the church was light orange colored brick and just very traditional in its style. So I did kind of picture all that immediately. I didn't realize it until you asked me that, and then it took me like another five seconds to realize that you were actually asking me. So, <laughs> right, and you know, some and sometimes the reason people don't answer, I, I don't know if it could have been the case or not, but sometimes people don't answer because um, we are so taught to give the right or wrong answer, the right answer. Do you know what I mean? In school, sure. you give the right answer, and and in this case, there is a right answer, obviously, because she was driving in a car, but you don't know what the actual right answer is. You only know the answer that like popped in your head. And like, we don't know. And in fact, this has been so many years ago now, like I don't even remember what it was, you know, if I ever knew, I don't remember if I ever looked on the ticket, what kind of car it was. But so we're so trained to give the right answer and some things have right or wrong answers, but some things don't. And sometimes it doesn't make any difference. If you picture one car, I picture another one and both, stories help us re- both ways remember help us remember the story to tell it back tonight wh- wh- who cares if it was a red car or a white car yeah both both paths lead us to the same destination right so in today's world with social media and technology uh, and you know this from being in uh, you know with the news and everything as well there's so much information there's so much uh, noise out there as a lot of people say uh, so companies, uh, especially, you know, they they realize the need to stand out and to build a connection with their audience or their clients or their suppliers. How often do you think companies crave an emotional connection with these folks, suppliers, clients, and audience? And, and you know, what are they what are they doing to help create that? Yeah, so I I think a lot of companies don't crave emotional connections. Quite frankly. They, you know, like sometimes when I go do training, I say, tell me, why do you do what you do? And everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people always say, um, because we got to make money. You know, we need to make money. And what what more and more companies are, are realizing is, like, I get it. Everybody needs to make money. But what companies are trying to realize, what companies are starting to realize is, that you actually need to have a bigger purpose than just being transactional. Because here's the thing, when you're only transactional, what happens is that's totally commoditizable, right? Because if I'm selling you the white widget and I'm charging you a price and somebody else comes around, they say, we're basically selling you the same thing and we can do it half price. If it's only about the transaction, you might go to them, right? But if it's actually about the mission and the purpose, you might not leave me just because somebody else is cheaper. So if my mission is I'm trying to help um, whatever the topic might be, you know, I'm trying to help this certain um, community with my white widgets, right, whether they're white or black or blue or whatever, doesn't make any difference, but you're buying into why I'm doing it. And now you're actually... Um, you we're differently connected than we were if it was truly just 
transactional. So this that's why companies need to change um, how they do things. I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, in, you know, I spend most of my time at, at MedTouch and we work with hospitals around the country, um, four offices around the country. And, and our CEO started the company because he had some um, less than positive experiences as a child with the healthcare system, like when his when his dad passed away, you know, um, and he said there there has to be a way to make these experiences better, and like he didn't share that story for a long time, but now, now that everything circles around that, and it comes back to this is why we do what we do, and um, and it's it's like it's a whole different ball game, right? When you actually say this is why we do it, and it's not like we're building web we're building websites, but we're building them because of this do you see what i mean it's more than just transactional mm-hmm. yep it's like that uh you know the power of the the face-to-face human interaction or the human interaction uh, doesn't go away you can't replace that with technology you can supplement it but you know what i hear you saying is you, you can't completely remove that and i feel like the companies that are the slowest to embrace this emotional connection are going to really be losing out and find themselves kind of uh, behind the times yeah, it it can happen. I mean, there's always, you know, there's some pe- some companies they have some kind of stronghold on some niche. It can be hard to move away from them. I mean, there's some companies I even deal with that it's really hard, even if I don't like their mission, to not work with them um, or to, to to be their customer. But absolutely, I mean, it's a differentiator when people tell good stories and they actually share them. And and the other thing is too. Good storytellers kind of stay in front of you all the time, right? And and like it doesn't get annoying because first of all you're used to it by now, and then second of all, most of their stuff is actually interesting. Mm-hmm. Kind of staying on the the topic of storytelling, uh, tell us some of the benefits that you have seen from your travels and your experience that an audience can reap from amusement for getting a little comic relief, you know, from other people's stories. Uh, let us know what you've seen there. Yeah, of course. So amusement, that's interesting. Um, so sometimes, you know, some things will happen to other people. Of course, you know, there it might be an, a funny story. Um, and depending on how people share it, you know, either they're okay that it's funny. Like the other day, um, I, I saw this college kid's story on the news. And um, basically, his, he was home for Christmas or Thanksgiving or I don't know, something. And and the mom sent him a package full of garbage, right? So the kid was surprised that he got that. And he, this was on the news, so they obviously wanted to share it. But the mom was making a point because he didn't take out the trash, right? So mm-hmm. it's kind of it's kind of a funny story. And they shared it openly. And why not? What's the big deal, right? Yeah. It's kind of interesting. And so... So, you know, some stories are amusing, some are eye-opening, and some are, are sad. So it kind of goes through those um, those different stages, um, obviously. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of comedy. You know, life's too short to be miserable, so laugh hard and laugh often. That's what I live by. Well, and the other thing is, too, I mean, if you make a mistake, I mean, big deal. Just admit it. I mean, all this stuff that's going on today is, you know, it's a learning experience. And things change, and you learn from it, and... You know, one of my favorite stories is still I, I, when I moved one blog into another. And the one blog had like a few hundred people on the mailing list. And guess, so I moved, automatically moved all the other posts to the new blog, which already had the mailing list. And every time I published a blog, a blog article, you know what happened? They all would get an email, right? Yeah. So, so I moved them automatically. And then guess what happened? As soon as all those posts started uploading, they got like 90 some emails because there were 90 new posts and you know, so today, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, so today I tell that certain like, so here's how you do it. Not like that, but here's how you do it. But it, why not share it? Why do I just hide behind? I made a mistake, big deal. I mean, people make mistakes and learn from it and figure out, you know, especially if it's not intentional or, you know, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next, I've got a question from a member of the Emotions Matter audience. Um, the question comes from Abe, 19-year-old from Nebraska. He'd like to know where you rank verbal communication on the list of essential business skills. 
I mean, I mean, they're all important, but verbal communication is really important. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's much more effective, quite frankly, than than um, sometimes the written word. I mean, I'm thinking about email, for example, might be one of the most least effect, uh, least effective method to to communicate. Honestly, so people sending long emails, oh, yeah. and then some people read them differently. So, totally important. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's number one or two or or whatnot. But it is important to be able to communicate verbally now. But remember, there are a lot of people, they need something visual, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know, sometimes maybe that's the reason why some people are so gung-ho on uh, PowerPoints. I, you know, personally, I don't, I don't use PowerPoints at all anymore when I speak. Um, I, I use them sometimes when I'm working with clients, but I really try to stay away from them. Uh, I think they're boring, but, but remember, some people need something visual, right? So they remember it. Um, but, but you know, you can carry, I mean, if you think about like TED Talks or, or any like interesting presentation, I mean, they, they hardly ever talk about, um, they hardly ever will be, um, they, they hardly ever use PowerPoints. Yep. Like you, I'm not a fan of PowerPoint. It's very, very boring as well. So, uh, I'm a big fan of the verbal communication as well. Like we've been talking about, it allows you to tell, to tell stories and, and connect on a very natural and um, you know authentic level. And uh, thank you for thank you for that. Hopefully that answers your question, Abe. Well, I know that you travel the world speaking and presenting and working with audiences and clients. Uh, and you mentioned earlier there might be another book in you at some point. What's next for you? What are you focusing on for the rest of 2017? Oh, that's still a ways to go for the rest of the year. But, um, you know, we got some webinars coming up pretty quickly here. And uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine conferences confirmed for the rest of the year. So that's going to be um, um, exciting. I'm heading to Berlin in the summer, uh, Sao Paulo in September. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's still really nice in Brazil in September. Um so we got that, and of course, you know, there's always work with with clients and um, anybody who is interested in in telling better stories. You know, it's always exciting to hear to hear from those people um, and and help them do it even more efficiently and effectively. Absolutely. If anybody listening today would like to connect with you, what's the best way they can get a hold of you? Uh, they, you know, they can go to my website, authenticstorytelling.net. Uh, drop me a note on there. There's a, a contact. But, of course, uh, Twitter works too, Etsy Trap. Sometimes that gets quite busy. So, um, you know, if I don't get back to you, just, just ping me again. But the website might be the best way. All right, sir. Well, on behalf of the Emotions Matter team, we appreciate your time today very much. You bet. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>